Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast with Rob Lewis and Austin Price. I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us. And a reminder, our friends at Blue Water Climate Control want to say thank you to the VolQuest listeners. VolQuest prefers uh, more people to Blue Water Climate Control than anybody else. That's the referrals coming through the website from VolQuest more than anywhere else. And Blue Water Climate Control wants to say thank you. That's why all VolQuest listeners get discounts on all service and repairs, which is really good because it's time to start turning on that AC. And fortunately, it might not work like it should. When that happens, you need to do what many others are doing. They call Blue Water Climate Control. Check out the reviews and you'll see story after story. Other companies tried to fix it, but Blue Water finally did. Call the guys who do the right repair the right way the first time. That's Blue Water Climate Control. Visit them online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com or give them a buzz at 865-299-2290. Don't forget, they're also still doing that drawing for those season tickets that's coming up a little bit later this month. The drawing is going to be on April 26th, so schedule your appointment with Blue Water Climate Control today, and you'll get registered to um, get those season tickets that are going to take place um, that they're going to give away coming up on the 26th. Again, if you call and schedule a spring heating and air tune-up with Blue Water Climate Control between now and the spring game, you'll put your name in that drawing for those season tickets. All right, plenty to get to on this edition of the podcast. Austin, let's start with some football. I don't want to dwell on it because I don't think it's Josh Heupel's fault, but Josh Heupel's in a bit of an interesting spot here given the fact that he's had more off the field news than obviously anybody wants. And certainly he wants the latest being Aaron Beasley being suspended. Josh Heupel needs football practice and, and needs the focus to be on football. He needs some guys on his football team to handle themselves better, to be honest with you. Yeah, Brent. I mean, you've covered football for 30 years. Rob's done it for a long time and I've done it for quite a few years. There have been fights. There have been uh, theft. There have been drugs. There have been a lot of different things. But the Aaron Beasley thing just is a whole nother level. I mean, like, you know, like you, just when you thought, like, there can't be anything weirder go on, you know, <laughs> Aaron Beasley does what, you know, he is – he, he, at least he's been accused of doing and what they're, you know, he's indefinitely suspended for – is, is bizarre to me. And so you're right. I mean, it's not really on, necessarily on Josh Heupel, but under his watch is kind of how this thing's all unfolded. And I'm sure he's like, I just want to coach ball. I just want to get our team installed in spring ball. I want to be able to do some stuff and, you know, and, 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 you know, move in the right direction. And I'm having to worry about these four guys are out because some nonsense in the dorm. Now all of a sudden Aaron Beasley, who's, who is one of your, you know, two or three warm bodies at a position your rail thin at is now indefinitely suspended because, you know, he, he allegedly, you know, um, you know, hurt a cat. I mean, <laughs> just you can't make this stuff up. Well, it's certainly, um, you know, a situation where, um, you know, it, it has landed Aaron Beasley suspended and, and we'll see, you know, what comes of that. Uh, as for the other four who were suspended, supposed to go before the uh, student conduct office in some capacity today. We'll see if, what, if anything comes out of that. We know that Caden Salter's case has been dropped. We think that would open the door for his return sooner rather than later. We'll see what happens with the rest of them. At linebacker, Rob, it's really interesting. Aaron Beasley was not a starter. He was not glued in. He was not, you know, the Pied Piper piece, but he was a guy who was getting – a lot of a lot of first team reps. He was a guy, as, as Austin, you know, said, was a, a warm body who had, had been on that side of the ball and had, you know, at least been on the field in special teams and, and played a little bit in some mop up duty. It's hard to sit there and look at that roster and find out where Tennessee's gonna find a two deep at the linebacker position at right now. I mean, you almost have to move one of the running backs now. Do you know if it's been talked about I mean, Whitehead, I guess being the leading candidate? I mean, that's, that shows you the situation that Tennessee's in on defense, that you can lose a guy who's barely scratched, you know, the, any playing time in, in, in two years, and it's a big deal. You know? Yeah. It's here's the one thing. Here's the one thing I think you got to keep in mind is, like, you know, Rob, you know, and, and I think we all agree that, like, you know, moving one of the running backs or moving – and Whitehead does make the most sense because he played so much defense in high school and played both ways. But, like, you know, with the current 
you know, with, with today's current athlete, like these kids, like if they don't get to play what they want to play, you know, it, it's just so easy for them to go, all right, portal. I mean, like, so you got to be careful of bouncing guys around a lot unless they're totally comfortable with it. Well, unless you not agree with that, yeah, I, I agree that that's something you have to deal with, but I think you have to have some realistic conversations too. I mean, you, you got to sit here and look at this is, 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 let's just use Lenneth Whitehead for an example. Is he one of the top two or three tailbacks on this team? I don't know the answer to that. If he is, then, then that's a very difficult conversation. If he's not, to me, it's an easier conversation for a coach to have. So, I, I mean, for, for, for me, it would be, where is he kind of at on the pecking order? Hey, Lennox, you can go from being third, fourth, fifth to being on the field with the first unit quickly on, on defense. And, and I think that's have to, how you have to sell it. And I, I agree with you, Austin, that the transfer portal causes a problem with that. Uh, but at the same time, too, um, you know, you, you got to look out. You got to look out for everybody. You look out for the entire team, not just an individual in, in some cases there. So we'll, we'll see if a conversation takes place with Leonard Whitehead or, or any other running back or anybody else to make a position switch. It's just they have a, they're going to have a hard time fielding linebackers, given where their number's at, if, if Aaron Beasley's situation is, is not going to get resolved where he could be back with, with this team. And, again, I'm not saying that he was – some all-conference player, but he was at this point with Roman Harrison limited, with Jeremy Banks limited, he was working with your first unit. I think the other thing, too, is, Rob, don't you have to live in nickel if you're this team? Aren't you in a four-two-five essentially the entire game now? I mean, unless probably, it's short I mean you probably were you probably were to begin with. Okay. I don't want to I don't want to sit here and say Tennessee's scrambling on Monday night to try to rework their scheme because Aaron Beasley got suspended. Okay. But I think when you talk about Crouch not here, Henry T not here, the lack of depth at linebacker, that's magnified when you talk about that, you know, Beasley there. It feels like you got to live in four two five. You know, even even in goal line, you know, you add an extra defensive lineman in there. I don't know, you know, I, I guess you could go with three linebackers and goal line stuff or short yardage. But otherwise, to me, you have to play with five defensive backs because you just don't have the bodies at linebacker. Yeah, I'd be surprised if that's not their base. And let's face it, I mean, that's the way college football is moving. Right. Anyway, I mean, except, you know, with, with rare exceptions, maybe an opponent here or there, that nickel is almost – I think everybody's base now. But – Tennessee's so thin that, I mean, finding four guys to fill out the TD. I mean, heck, finding two guys that are quality starters at linebacker. You just don't know. Yeah, it's it's not a good situation there for sure. All right, let's talk about big picture with this team, Austin. You had a chance to see them last week. I know the the, the, the viewing was limited in terms of time that, that you got to see. But what, what's your takeaway from getting an opportunity to see practice last week? Well, I mean, we talked about it last week. I mean, they, they, they've got some talent. The coverage's not bare, but they're just real thin. I mean, they just they, – they can't you, – you can't have really any injuries on the offensive line or you're looking at a lot of inexperience. You can't have injuries in the secondary or you're looking at a lot of inexperience. Uh, the one place I feel like you you could survive an injury or two would be the defensive line because they do have more bodies there than they may be doing anywhere on the team. Um you know, and then, you know, who, who emerges as a, as a real threat of receiver? Jimmy Callaway drew some praise, looks the part. You know, does he continue his ascension? You know, can Malachi Weidman give them anything outside of just working off on the side? Um, you know, and then, you know, where do your running backs, you know, fall out? Jabari Small seems like he has got probably um, the most momentum right now. You know, but, you know, where's Tyon Evans at, you know, when they, when they get him back on the field. And part of this with Tyon, you know, he injured his ankle, but as part of that, just learning to practice. You know, I mean, he comes from the JUCO ranks. I mean, it, it, the, those kids in the junior college world, they take days off all the time because, you know, they're, all, they're allowed to in a lot of ways. So, you know, you know, learning to practice, learning to tough it out when maybe you don't feel 100%. Like, that, to me, that's an important part of a guy like Tyon Evans is, you know, you know, it's not that he's a prima donna. It's just about learning to work, you know, learning to be consistent and, you know, understand that you're not always going to be, you know, perfect when you're on the field. Well, and throw in the fact that he didn't play this past fall, didn't practice yeah. this past fall. I mean, it's been 
it's been a long time since he's been on the football field and, and been going through anything there as well. So, Rob, what do you what do you want to hear out of Tennessee's camp? If you're a Tennessee fan, what do you want to hear out of Tennessee's camp this week? I'm just that the sophomore receivers, you know, somebody, whether it's Callaway, who, who I guess is the guy that's that's the healthiest right now, but not been, you know, is he taking advantage of his reps? Because I think, you know, we talked about it. Not only do they need somebody to step up just for pure produ- production purposes. I mean, Velas and, and Jalen Hyde are the only two guys that caught more than nine balls a year ago. I mean, they're, they're going to need some depth. I mean, I think like you know, six, seven, eight guys, because if, if they're going to play at the pace – that Heupel is going to want to play at. I mean, you're not going to run, you know, three 20-yard routes and, and get back to the line of scrimmage and, and at the rate he's going and be able to play, you know, 80, 85 snaps in a game. And that, so to me, and and I don't know that we're going to hear anything on, definitive on quarterbacks, but I guess you'd like to get a sense that, you know, Tennessee at least has some viable options there. I don't know how realistic that is after two weeks, but because, you know, I kind of think the defense is going to be, rough sledding. So I guess what I, if I'm a fan, what I want to be hearing is that what looked like an offense that was capable of scoring points that you've got some guys, you know, showing some development. Austin, it feels like in talking to people that the offense is, is a good bit ahead of the defense at this point. I don't think that's a huge shocking development, but it sounds like the offense has had their way at times, you know, sometimes with the defense, they've made some plays there. But what do you want to hear out of the Tennessee camp? What do you want to see out of the Tennessee camp this week? I think the defense is kind of where they are, Brent. I mean, like they're real thin. They've got so many injuries, just they're depleted. So I'm going to go ahead and just say, you know, let, let those guys continue to build and, and kind of work on the install. But I think you want to continue to hear more, more, uh, you know, offensive momentum. You know, you, to me, you don't want to hear anything about the defense making any kind of adjustments, having better, a better feel for things. You want the offense to be, you know, having success. One, because I think that this program needs some shot of confidence. Um, but two, because, you know, that's kind of where you are. Like you're, you're going against a team, a defense that just doesn't have a whole lot. So like if they're making plays on you, that's probably not a good sign. So you, to me, you want to continue to hear the Tennessee's offense, you know, they want, you know having its way, whatever you want to say it uh, in practice. I mean, you know, the, the, having success is, is the uh, story of the, the week. Yeah, and because we all agree that the uh, that this is a more talented offensive team than it is defensive team, I, I don't think anybody debates that or, or wonders about that at, at this point. So I we'll, as, far as to call them good on offense or have the potential to be good, you would you would go there you would go there is what you said. I would say they have the potential to be a good offense. You agree with that, if, Austin? If they get quarterback play, yeah, I do. I mean, like I I think you know boils down to shearing up a couple of spots on the offensive line. But I do think there's talent at receiver. Even if it's unproven, there's talent there. There's talent at running back, even if it's unproven. I, I think that they'll use Jacob Warren and some of those tight ends in a way that sets them up to be successful. So, yeah, I think that if you can fill in the the kind of the holes that you potentially have on the offensive line and then get better quarterback play, I 100% agree with Rob. Well, Tennessee's going to need them to be successful because they're going to need to, they're going to have to score some points, no, no doubt about that. So we'll see what comes out of camp uh, this week. As um, later today, we're scheduled to hear from uh, Jerry Mack. Be curious to see what he says about his guys. You mentioned Ty and Evans. What does he say about D Beckwith and his role potentially with the running backs? What does he think of uh, Jalen Wright, the newcomer there, who's made a couple of plays, it sounds like, who's flashed a couple of times. And then we'll also hear from Willie Martinez, uh, who's working with a depleted unit back there. We'll get a, a sense for where he thinks that group is and what, what he thinks he might have with that group. So that's coming up later this evening. Before we get into some recruiting stuff, I, I want to I hop into hoops right quick, jo- uh, Rob, because there's been um, just, so much, just so much news in, in, the, in the hoops world uh, the last three or four days. Rick Barnes has lost two assistants. He's hired one, um, and he's picked up a transfer a- as well and, and the Powell kid from Auburn. Let's start with the coaching staff. Um, I- anything, I- anything surprise you there? What, what do you think of, what do you think of the new hire? What, what do you, what do you get a sense on, on kind of maybe where um, Rick Barnes is going to go with that final spot as well? Well, just on the new hire, I'm a little surprised that, you know, Rick, 
pulled the trigger on a guy that only has two years of you know, coaching experience at this level, um, or not at this level, but at lower levels. But I'm I'm not surprised um, that he went young. I mean, I, I kind of had put that in the war room and we talked about it. He really liked having a young guy like Kim English on his staff, liked what you know it brought to the program, liked how it kind of energized the culture. Not that he was you know, he, he wasn't in the same generation as the players, but he wasn't so far removed from it. You know, really felt like that kind of helped the coaching staff stay connected. So uh, in that sense, Ron Clark, you know, kind of fits, check, checks that box. I mean, this, uh, I've talked to several people <clears throat> that, that know him or know people that he has worked with. And, and the, the young man is dialed in to the grassroots for who did the grassroots hoop scene uh, work, you know, kind of got his foot in the door working with, uh, Nike's grassroots program in Kansas city, which is one of the longest running in in the country. And it's a, you know, it's not some fly by night AU outfit. I mean, this is an established program that is a perennial power. And um, then worked at Sunrise Christian Academy where you know, Kennedy Chandler is now, and it is just loaded every year. I mean, the, the guy's got some contacts. I think he'll be an asset on the recruiting trail. As for the next spot, I think it's going to be a guy that was a lot like Des Oliver, a veteran that has ties in the South. Um, maybe not necessarily Carolina, although Tennessee has done pretty well over there with Grant Williams and Jaden Springer, but certainly Georgia and points you know east and, and south of there. Atlanta always going to be a factor for Tennessee, and um, you know I don't I don't know how far down the road Tennessee is with this. But, uh, one interesting name I heard over the weekend I mentioned on on the board was Al Pinkins, who was on Donnie Tindall's last staff here. Um, is somebody that Tennessee may have interest in talking with. He would he would check a lot of those boxes um, that Des Oliver that Des Oliver's departure leaves blank. Um, he's you know he's coaching this league. He's he's currently at Florida, and you know, pretty clearly was not tainted with any of the Donald, Donnie Tindall stench because Mike White is a guy that has a reputation for running a, a, a clean program. So for Rick to even entertain that notion tells you that you know, he's done done his done some background work and is, would be comfortable with that. And Al, Al's a guy that has a good reputation working with big men too, and that's certainly an area where Tennessee could use some development. A lot of people have asked this question uh, the last, I don't know, 36 hours or so. With the loss of English, with the loss of Des Oliver, it looked like Tennessee, with those two guys here, pretty set in their class almost for the next two years and kind of identifying where they were and kind of who they were in with. How, how much is Tennessee's recruiting affected by the loss of, of those two guys? And, and you, can they overcome that? Is it something that's going to really put them in, in trouble? Maybe not this year, but next year. Where, where does the loss of those two guys – Put, put Rick Barnes in his program in terms of recruiting the type of talent we've seen well, him recruit the last couple of years. You definitely got to pick up the pieces, but he's also you know, going to just have a, a, an enormous amount of quality candidates to choose from. I mean, people may look at, you know, the, the Clark Kyrus and the kids from Austin P. He can't, you know, Rick must not have anybody want the job. That's not the case. Rick, Rick had tons of interest in this job. I'm, I'm literally – can, can tell you firsthand that he had hundreds of calls, inquiries about getting this job and, and liked everything he knew about Rod Clark. So, um, and, and he'll make another quality hire to replace Oliver. I don't have any doubt about that at all. But the biggest challenge is going to be, you know, making and, and also me give Mike Schwartz credit. It's not, you know, Oliver was the lead guy on, on Huntley Hatfield, but it, Schwartz has a relationship with Bobby Mays and, and that program. He talks to guys. It's not like, you know, he's not been involved at all. And he, he can be a bridge and hand it off to the next guy or he can handle that one and try to get it home himself. I don't think that's a stretch um, for that. But, yeah, I mean, you lose two quality guys like that and, and the fact that they both left and got head coaching jobs, you know, kind of tells you what, what their reputation is. It's, um, you know, it's not automatic that you're not going to have some struggles. All right, let's talk about the transfer. They get, they get the one, one more, two more. I think they'd love to add one more, um, and I wouldn't rule out two more, but they'd really have to be the right guys. Um, the girly kid from Furman is – I mean, they made his final eight. But, you know, that's that's a long way from, from home. Walker Kessler is the guy everybody wants to talk about. I think Tennessee is in that one a little bit, partly because he and Justin Powell are buddies. But I don't know that that's going to be enough to close the deal there. 
and um, Oliver had been his lead recruiter since back in, in Kessler's junior year. So I don't, I don't know how much work that, that they had to, how much ground they would have to make up there. And I talked to somebody that has been following that situation pretty closely on um, Monday night. And, and he felt like Gonzaga was the team to beat that Auburn had kind of moved up to the surprise of some and um, Kentucky. I'm told, I'm told Kessler wants to shoot threes and the family wants Kessler to expand the game and shoot threes. You think that's why Auburn's made that move, Rob? I think that's a big factor. Big factor. It's also the closest school to home that he's considering by far. By far. And, and Kentucky is, is a huge factor as well. And, and Tennessee's in their swing, and I don't want to say they don't have a chance, but the way it was described to meet it up was it was a slim chance. In, uh, what, in opinion. And, and Justin Powell, I, I think it's a great pickup for Tennessee. Um, Tennessee, not a great shooting team last year at all. I mean, unless Victor Bailey had been, had been one of those nights where, where he was cooking. Um, Powell, it was a small sample size. He just played 10 games before getting injured this year at Auburn, but made 44% from three. He's a, he's a big, strong guard, six foot six. Um, and maybe behind Kessler, I think just in talking to people, probably, you know, maybe Tennessee's top target outside of Kessler, top realistic target outside of Kessler. That was on the mar- on the transfer market when, the, when all this madness started. So we'll see what happens on the transfer market for Tennessee and the madness continuing there. Do more people enter the portal? Uh, does Tennessee get home with anybody else? Um, and then, of course, obviously continuing to watch this Tennessee roster. You believe, Rob, that there'll still be movement there at some point in time as well, right? Yeah, I think Tennessee will have another guy leave. Uh, I do. And I don't – I mean, there are a couple of possibilities that – that are that have yet to enter the portal that I've been told are, are maybes that would be that Tennessee would really be involved with if, that if Tennessee happens. that that if that are at other schools that would yes. enter the portal that Tennessee would would covet those guys all right so we'll keep track uh, of all that we'll continue to follow all of that in the hoops world as well all right let's go to the football recruiting world quickly here Austin I don't know that there's a whole lot new um feels like there's going to be some movement this month some guys making some decisions we know the wade twins scheduled to do something this month as well looks like tennessee and kentucky uh maybe some more movement in the state of tennessee th- this month as well with, with guys making decisions yeah I mean, we put in the war room last week i mean I, I would be shocked if if elijah herring gets out of the month without without making a decision um you know i i think the wades you know they're going to go the 16th and, um, you know, if Tennessee can get that one to the finish line, then, you know, I would expect, you know, Elijah Herring to do something after that. So, um, I'd be interested to see, you know, you know how this all plays out. But, you know, I know um, the Kentucky side, you know, on the rival side feels pretty confident that the Wades are going to Kentucky. Um, you know, I, I continue to stand by the fact I think Tennessee's, you know, trend been trending there for a while. Um, they they still got to get it to the finish line. You know, and then and that you know that's something that you know I've continued to say. I mean, like you can't just take it for granted just because you've got a lot of the momentum. You've got to be able to get that thing across the finish line. And then and and you know I do believe that you know the messaging on everything is very important. I mean, Destin Wade wants to play quarterback. Does he know that he's probably going to end up playing somewhere else? I think yeah, he knows deep down. He may not be a quarterback. He just wants to try, just like Jimmy Holiday wanted to try, which is why he practiced two days last year, Brent, at quarterback. And then before they even got back here, coming out of COVID, had already told the coaches he was ready to move to receiver. You know, Jawan Jennings went through spring, you know, that year and then made the move to receiver. So, you know, I, I think it's all about, you know, doing it, you know, the right way as far as, you know, making sure Destin gets a legitimate chance to play quarterback. And I think Tennessee will do that. And a hundred years ago, Philip Fulmer could have had Randall Cobb if he would have let him practice for two days at quarterback. Yep, this yeah. is true. He could have. It's a good point. Uh, so the Wades visit Kentucky last, correct? They got Virginia left and Kentucky before. Well, they went to Virginia this past weekend. Okay. So Virginia's done. So they've got Kentucky left for a visit, correct? Uh-huh. That's the last place that they're scheduled to see before they make their decision and, and make their announcement there. Um, all right, what else in recruiting jumps out to you? Uh, I mean, just Tennessee's, you know, they're working a couple of different, you know, linebackers in the state of Georgia pretty hard. Um, Joshua Josephs, EJ Lightsey. Um, you know, I talked to Jeremy Patton, um, kid out of Texas. I mean, 
he sure seems like he's going to go in that little kind of little belt down there to LSU, Oklahoma, or Texas. Um, but it was just kind of interesting to hear his take on Josh Heupel and Brian Jean Mary and the, the, the staff, you know, I mean, like we talked so many to the in-state kids, um, that, you know, you get kind of an outsider's point of view when you talk to a kid that's four States over and, you know, what does he think? And, you know, compared to the last staff or just in general, um, you know, so, I mean, uh, Tennessee's continued to try to work, you know, kids out of the state. Um, to me, Tennessee's got to, you know, get their share in state rent. And then they've got to land guys like, you know, Addison Nichols, who you have already a ready-made relationship with. You know, to me, that's as important as anything. You're going to swing on some long shots, whether it's a Jeremy Patton, a, a Branson Robinson, the running back from Mississippi, you know, uh, Ryan Brubaker from Pennsylvania. All those guys likely are going to end up elsewhere. Um, but you, you still swing at them. But to me, Tennessee's got to find a way to land their share in state. To me, that's 10. Okay. Land, I think they got to land 10 guys in this state. Um, and then, uh, and I think that's doable, you know, and, and some of these guys that the fans have been asking for, I don't think that they're necessarily high on Tennessee's board, you know, um, you know, I, you know, as far I mean, like, it's not that Tennessee doesn't like them, but like, again, if you're not, you know, over the moon for them, you know, then you don't want to waste their time, you know, and, and put them in a weird spot in their recruitment either. So, um, you know, I think Tennessee's got to land 10 in the state and they got to take care of business with guys they have built in relationships with out of state. And you know yeah. what else I, I would add? I mean, some of these guys that, that fans covet may end up, I mean, not being the, the, the level prospect that somebody thinks, a lot of them, because how, how much of people's ratings in this, in, in that 22 class are made up from what they did the summer after their freshman year in high school. Yeah, no doubt. You know, it's a good point. I mean, like, you know, no, no and, and I'll, I'll keep this on the Knoxville level. And this is nothing against the Darius Redmond. I think the Darius Redmond's a really good football player. Rivals has him number 57 in the country. I think he's way overranked. Is he a top 250 player? Yeah, I think so. And could he be number 57? Yeah, I do believe that too. But like right now, he's not that. You know, he hardly played as a sophomore. He was banged up. He was injured. You know, he just did not have a great sophomore year. And, and, and you know, uh, you know, a lot of his rankings based off of what he got as a freshman in high school, to Rob's point, the offers he got, LSU, Tennessee, Georgia, you know. And so, um, you know, my, my thing is, is like there's going to be, whether it be the 21 class because they didn't get to visit anywhere and they get to camp anywhere, the 22 class, um, you know, because, because even when they, you know, let's say that things go through and they get to start visiting in June, you're still going to have a small window of camps. So it's not going to be your normal deal where it's kind of spread out. And you've got rivals camps and MVP camps and, and, you know, on campus camps and ever, there's all this film out there. There'll be some, but it's not going to be what it normally is. So, you know, I do think that you're naturally two or three years from now going to look up with this 21 class and the 22 class and go, man, how did team, how did, how did Oklahoma miss on this kid from Midwest City, you know, who's playing at Tulsa? Or how did, you know, Tennessee miss on a kid from wherever? I mean, you know, I think you're inevitably going to end up and see that a lot, you know. So, yeah, I agree with Rob and, and think that, you know, that's just kind of where this current recruiting process is at. Yep, there's obviously a big gap, and and and, there's, and it's not anybody's fault. There's just a gap there because there was not any evaluation. You know, some kids didn't even play a year of ball. There was certainly no on-campus evaluations or off-campus evaluations, and the camp scene uh, was dormant for a year. So that's where you see some guys' rankings who were who were going to you know probably change pretty dramatically over the course of the next six or eight months. Uh, to your point, Rob, which is a good one, AP. Yeah, I, you know, and, and I do want to. I do want to preface, it was not me, because I just know how this goes down. People hear what they want to hear. That's not me picking on a Darius Redman. I think a Darius Redman is a really good football player, much like I think his teammate, Aiden Green or J.J. Faust, are really good football players. I think all these kids have really been hampered by the fact that there it was no camp scene. There was no camp scene a year ago, and how important that is. Look at a guy like Lance Williams, keeping it also local at Alcoa, Brent. How much, you know, he was a state champion wrestler as a freshman in the heavyweight division. How, how much did his football prospects get hampered by the fact he couldn't camp anywhere last fall yep. or last summer and hasn't, you know, had, didn't camp um, you know, over the last year? I, I think there's tons of kids and tons of instances like that across the United States. 
Yep. No, I agree with you. And again, there's two folks. Some guys who were vastly underrated, you know, and some guys whose ranking probably shifts because of where their development is or isn't between their freshman and sophomore seasons, you know, heading into their junior year, which is the point that you guys are making. I think it's a great point uh, that will make it interesting to see what the month of June looks like, which is why coaches are clamoring so hard to get guys on campus uh, for camps, for evaluations, and, and all of those things, which are going to be um, – it's going to be wild in the month of June. There's no question about that. We'll follow that recruiting. We'll follow spring football. We'll continue to follow hoops as Rick Barnes looks for a staff member. They continue to troll in the transfer portal. Plenty of things to discuss. The baseball team's playing well. We'll discuss that on the general's quarters as well. Plenty of things to talk about. Uh, throughout the rest of this week at VolQuest.com. That's going to do it for this edition of the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast. For Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody.